everybody. Welcome to exciting semester of Chem 170, Organic Chemistry, with your host, me, Dr. White. Hi, everybody. Now, for those of you who are not here, I'll be videotaping this and posting it on my YouTube channel for Chem 170. But for those of you who are here, hi. All right, let's get to work. A couple of things. First of all, this semester, you'll learn a lot about me personally. And one of the first things I have to tell you is my hearing. Uh, if you can see the picture, I don't have my hearing aids on. Why? Because right above my monitor, I have two large amplified speakers that are cranked up, so I don't need my hearing aids. What that means is if you do ask a question, I might ask you to repeat it. Even then with the monitor, sometimes I have trouble hearing. Now, the next thing I'm going to talk about is probably one of the most important things I'll talk about today. And that is, in my world, in my class, there's no such thing as a dumb question. Again, in my world, in my class, there's no such thing as a dumb question. I learned that in grad school from a postdoctoral fellow who was in our research group. He asked a question about something very basic uh, in organic chemistry that most undergrads know, and here's a PhD didn't. And he asked me, I happened to be talking, and afterward, I went up to this postdoctoral fellow. His name is Dr. Larry Palavin. I haven't seen him in decades, but, and I said, Larry, weren't you embarrassed asking that question? We teach that answer to undergrads, chem undergrads. He said, why should I be embarrassed? I didn't know it. You taught me how to answer my question. Now I know it. And then at that point, and since then, it dawned on me, never be afraid to ask questions. And I came up with the concept, there's no such thing as a dumb question. I practice it in my classroom. I practice it in my life. Always, always feel free to ask questions. All right, a little background about me, Dr. White. And that is I got my bachelor's degree in chemistry from Illinois Institute of Technology. I got my PhD in synthetic organic chemistry. Synthetic is a fancy word meaning to make from Michigan State. Uh, my advisor, PhD advisor was Dr. William Roosh, who I will be forever grateful to, who helped me lay the foundation, very strong foundation of organic chemistry. By the way, this is blueberry tea from the Republic of Tea. My first mug was my all-time favorite vanilla almond from the same company. All right. Before we go any further, and for those of you who have are online with your computer, give me a thumbs up with the emoji, if you can see this on your screen. Can you see that, Andrew? Thank you. One thing with chat, sometimes it takes me a second or two to look at the bottom of the screen. I should be looking at this. All right, this molecule, CH3, CH2, CH3 is propane. And I can even write it in red ink. CH3, CH2, CH3, propane. And that's the material you get in the white tanks for your barbecue, propane. CH3, CH2, CH3. Don't write this down. Over the next 50 minutes or so, I'm going to be trying to set the world Guinness Book of World Record for saying the most times propane, CH3, CH2, CH3. All 
All right. Now, let's talk about this course. Hopefully, you're familiar with Desire to Learn, D2L, which is the ECC, Elgin Community College's Learning Management System, also known as LIMS. And if we go to D2L, everybody should see your, see the home page here. And this you should be able to log into. If you go to the college's main website, let's see if I can get there quickly. You should see it on your screen right now. You go to resources in the upper right-hand corner, click on that, you'll see a button for D2L. You click on that and you log in. Now, if you have any problems getting into D2L, I'd highly recommend contact the computer help desk at Elgin Community College, ECC, and they are very helpful and they'll help you get in. Now, I've already logged in, and this is the one, Chem 170 login page. Have you noticed I have my welcome announcement? Over on the right, on the left, I have times for our Zoom meeting. Here's the link to the Zoom meeting if you ever need to get it. It's also in the syllabus. It's also here on the announcement to, for the Zoom meeting for our lab and lecture. Now, on Monday and Wednesday nights from 5 to 6.15, I'll have office hours. And it's a different link in. Here's a click you can click, uh, a link you can click on. Or if you notice here, I have also, if you scroll down, this is also in the syllabus, I have the login meeting URL. Now, let's take a look at this. If you click on content, you'll see overview, which I have nothing there. And you'll see on the right, on the left, why well, I'm getting my right and left, the syllabus. And I'll talk about that in a little while. Here again, I have the login information for both the class lectures, labs, and a separate one for office hours. Now, also, I have a folder with lectures, all my lecture slides, and I use Word, and I also save it as a PDF file. Trust me, I've been, I'll talk to you, I'll talk about it in a second. I've done more PowerPoint presentations than I can remember, but for students, Word works out much better when I'm lecturing for you. I also have practice problems and practice problem answers. Here I have a link to YouTube channel. Here you don't see it, I do. I have my extra credit projects. Here I have the learning modules, which are essentially what I have. And finally, I have Dr. White's favorite music, movies, and uh, books. Why did I put that there? Because a couple of years ago, I found out a lot of my students didn't know about the good things in life because of a generation gap. You notice I'm a little older than you are. And what I did was put down favorite music, movies, and books. Uh, my claim to fame, I've seen some great uh, music musicians play. The best I ever saw was in senior year high school. I saw Jimi Hendrix play live here in Chicago. That, that's the only time he ever played in Chicago. Oh, that was one heck of a concert. Uh, uh, what a great concert. All right. Now, in contents, like I said, we have the syllabus and my lectures and practice problems. All right, now in the syllabus area, and I'm gonna open it up from my computer instead of from D2L. Let's go through this, this is important. 
Oh, I forgot to do something. Propane, CH3, CH2, CH3. Propane, don't write this down. All right. Does everybody see student course syllabus? I do that because sometimes Zoom will tell me that you're um, you're seeing it and you're not. I am. So yeah, hopefully you're all. It. Thank you. All right. Now here I have the syllabus. Now if you notice, I have an office phone number here. That's a voicemail box. And I can't remember what year I checked it yet last. I don't even remember the password. The best way is to use my email. And I'll talk about that in a second. We'll be meeting. And this is a internet class. It's not a VCM, so it's optional. But come to the lectures that will help you. Uh, on Monday and Wednesday from 1 to 3.50. On Wednesday, we'll get out earlier than 3.50. And I'll talk about this. Here's the link information for the Zoom meeting. Uh, all my lecture and lab meetings will be videotaped within 24 hours or less. Usually by the end of the evening, I'll have it posted in my YouTube channel. Now let me just quickly go over there. You should see on your screen the YouTube. Here's summer. And then I think I have, I forgot, almost three or four full semesters. If you go back to say uh, last semester, uh, uh, last spring semester, no spring, last fall semester, you'll see I'm wearing glasses. Uh, last November, I had major cataract surgery in both eyes. Turned out really, really good. I don't need to wear glasses anymore, which is a joy. And if you need a name of an outstanding, I mean outstanding, eye surgeon, especially for cataracts, let me know. His name is Dr. Cabin. He's located in Hoffman Estates. He does the surgery in Hoffman Estates, and he's amazing. Really great guy and an amazing doctor. But anyways, by the end of the day, by 10 o'clock or earlier, unless something unusual comes up, and then it will be 24 hours, but by 10 o'clock tonight, I'll have today's meeting posted on my YouTube channel, which is available to all of you to see. Speaking about seeing, propane, CH3, CH2, CH3. That's the gas or the material in the white tanks for your barbecue. If you have ever worked on a construction site, those are also used to uh, power heat areas and a construction site. All right, let's continue going through here. Now, the easiest way and the best way to reach me is email. I check my email usually twice a day, every day, Saturday and Sunday. However, I'm an early riser. I usually go to bed about 11.15 and I'm up and on my computer by 5.30 a.m., quarter to six. I usually check my email then. I'm teaching at another school in the morning, so I won't teach, look at it while I'm teaching. I teach also at College of DuPage. And usually sometime after six, before 10, I'll check my email a second time. All right, here's the course outline, which all faculty are required to put in their syllabus. I'll let you read that on your own. One of the things, oh, I think I left it totally out of here, which is, I'll tell you why. 
Uh, you don't need a lab book and you don't need a textbook. I'll have to modify this. An optional textbook is by heart. Here's the textbook. This is the latest edition, I believe. And this is by Harold Hart and a whole bunch of other people, including his son. When I was at Michigan State as a grad student, Dr. Hart, Harold Hart, who wrote this book originally, was there. By then, that was already making him a lot of money. But he was more known for the research he did in organic chemistry. But anyways, it's a good book, but I've given this to students. I have extra copies when I've taught face-to-face. -face. And within about three weeks, I always get it back because the students say, we don't really need it. Your lectures, your lecture slides, and your practice problems, we don't need the book. And they do well. So I'll put that, well, excuse me, I'll put that in the syllabus. I forgot to, but it's totally optional. Now. There's no lab, but first, propane is still CH3, CH2, CH3. Propane, the stuff you use for your barbecue. Now, for the labs, we're gonna do that online labs. What I've done is the labs, when I inherited Chem 170 a long time ago, the labs were awful. And because of the short period of lab time, an hour and 50 minutes, other schools have two hours and 50 minutes, COD, uh, ECC is so an hour less, I had to write my own labs and I did. And we'll be doing those. However, since you're not gonna be working with chemicals in your house, especially organic chemistry, I will have the handouts, which will be available for you to download for each lab. We we'll already have the data in there, but you still have to, and I'll teach you about the information, interpret the data and answer questions, which is what you'd have to do face to face. You should have access to D2L and a webcam. Turn on your webcam if you can, it makes Dr. White happy. I'll work on you. And access to D2L. Here's the course description again. Now, attendance is recommended. I'm not taking attendance. Uh, when we're face-to-face, -face, I actually have in my syllabus. If you mix more than five classes, I reserve the right to give you an F, but I don't do that on the internet classes. But I'd highly recommend you show up. This way you can ask questions, and also you won't fall behind. And I've seen students who don't show up and say, oh, I'm going to watch the video. And they fall behind. They don't get a good score on tests and they don't get a good grade. So please show up if you can or watch the videos. Behavior, don't cheat on exams. And if you have any bad behavior, I'll let the dean know about it, let you know about it to correct it. That's never happened and the internet class, I only had three students all the years I've been teaching. And that's been over at the other school. I have to invoke this. But anyways, all right. Now, you should try and prepare, especially read the, uh, do the practice problems before I discuss them in class. That's important. Now, don't raise your hand, don't let me know right now, but if we have any special needs students, let me know in private about your special needs and the center uh, at CO, uh, ECC, by the way, since I teach at both schools once in a while, at ECC, I'll say COD, this morning at COD, I was once or twice at ECC. I do that, but I'll correct myself. Contact me in private, and I will work with you to meet your special needs. I've always supported the center, 
I've always supported special needs students. I've had a lot of them in my class over the years. They've done well. And like I said, I support special needs students. But first, a break from it's propane, CH3, CH2, CH3, propane. Oh, I've got it in red, CH3, CH2, CH3, propane. Now, this semester, I'll be giving four exams online, and I'll talk later on in the semester how I do that. You'll have a, a window time frame of 24 hours to take the test and upload your answers. If you don't have a scanner, I have information and instructions how to use a cell phone, take pictures of stuff, and convert it to a PDF, which then you can upload to Desire to Learn D2L. And I'll cover that right before a test. I'll show you how to do that, or the first lab. Uh, there'll be a two-hour comprehensive final on Monday the 12th. What that means is at 1 p.m., I'll send out the password for a password-protected PDF file, and you'll have until 1 p.m. the next day, 24 hours to take the test and upload your answers. Now, on my test, I give extra credit, and there'll be one special extra credit optional prob project that will be 10 bonus points, and that will be that. If you get sick or something happens in your family, let me know. I try and help work with all students if they need to make up an exam, especially in, how should I say, our environment of COVID-19. Now, before I do this, once again, Guinness Book of World Record time, propane, CH3, CH2, CH3, that's propane. Now, when it comes to grading, we're gonna have four exams. I take the highest three test scores of the four and add them together. And each test is 100 points, not counting the bonus points, so it's 300 points. Your final exam, relax. Students do good on my final exam. They do good in my class. And here, that will be worth 200 points. And then we'll be doing labs and they'll be worth 132 points added up. That should actually be 632. And how do you get a grade? Well, the percentage is calculated as this formula, the sum of the three highest test scores, your final exam score, your lab total score, and if you did the extra credit project times 100, divided by 632, I got it right there. And that percentage, if it's 90 or greater, you get an A, 80 to 89 B, 79 C, and 60 to 69 D, and less than that, 59 or less F. I can tell you this, last semester and other semesters, usually if you follow what I'm gonna be teaching you, how to do well in this course, and practice, usually 60 to 65% of my students, and listen carefully, earn an A. And a lot of the rest get Bs. So they do quite well. And because we're on the internet, I will be handing back scores via email. Uh, I don't do any grading over, uh, talk about grades over the phone, but we can do D2 um, Zoom meetings. When I wrote this and I still don't have it, I'll have to find what's the deadline for withdrawal. But I'll be honest with you, over the years I've been teaching Chem 170 and I've been doing it a number of years. I also have taught Chem 112 here and Chem 101 was our general chemistry. Very rarely does a student withdraw, usually if they're transferred out of the area with their job. 
incompletes, if you have a reason because of doctor's problem, medical or whatever, I'll work with you on that. All right, before I go into the next thing, propane, CH3, CH2, CH3, propane. Notice three carbons, three plus two is five, plus three more, eight hydrogen. And propane is the gas for your barbecue. All right, here's the tentative course outline. And I have on here the learning modules, uh, but follow the YouTube or come to my lecture. And here there's a various outline for the whole semester where you have the test. Now, one thing that's helped students over the years, and I've been teaching Chem 170 for a number of years, you can go and look at ratemyprofessor.com to see that I'm not telling you a lie. I don't lie. But anyways, on the Monday before a test, all my tests will be on Wednesday, except the final, which is on a Monday, I do a review. And I go through all the material you should know for the test on the following Wednesday, which will also be due the next day, Thursday, you'll have a 24 hour window. And this helps students, so I do it. And here are the various <clears throat> chapters. The second to last week, that whole week, I spend on review, which is why students also do well on my final. And before we go to lab, propane, CH3, CH2, CH3, propane. Now the lab, there's no lab manual. You're expected to attend all labs or watch it on YouTube. And uh, students are expected to hand in labs by the beginning of the next lab section. And I'll have that in the assignment area in there. Oh, we've got someone else joining us. Hi, Ignacio. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. If not, uh, let me know. And whatever you miss, you can watch it on the video I'll be posting later on. All right, now, your final grade, and I think, did I get my percentage wrong? Uh, it should be 21%. Yeah, I make mistakes like that. Oh, by the way, I don't walk on water unless it's frozen, and even then I stay off it. In other words, guess what? I sometimes make mistakes, and if I do, correct me. Now, we're going to have 13 labs, and I'll take the top 12. So for some reason, you can't do a lab or don't hand it in, you won't hurt your grade. Now, labs are due the following week after we actually discuss it. And for a late lab report, you'll lose two points. If you're more than eight days late, you get zero points if you don't hand in a lab. Now, let me talk about something. For some reason, I don't know why, and if it's because of the pandemic or whatever, uh, in the last year, year and a half, in this class and other classes, a lot of students haven't been handing in labs, and that hurts your grade. Last semester, Chem 170 had one student who lost a whole letter grade from what that student should have earned because they didn't hand in a lot of labs. They're easy points. I shouldn't have said that. But anyways, they're doable. My labs are not, write-ups are not hard. And I teach you the skills to answer the questions in them. So they're easy points. So hand in labs on time, please. Oh, by the way, propane, I'm doing the world's Guinness Book of World Record saying propane the most times in a 50 minute period the CH3, CH2, CH3. You don't have to write this down. And that's the stuff in barbecue tanks, the white ones you can get just about anywhere now. Now, 
Here is the lab schedule. They'll be on Wednesdays. And I see I didn't change the date here. That should be 24. I'll have to change these. Labs are on Wednesday. And here are the various labs. Now, the last week, if we were face-to-face, -face, we wouldn't have a lab. And we'd be doing, uh, what I'll be doing is review that whole week. And that allows me to do a number of hours of review the week before the final, which helps students do well. Now, at the very end, we have a student agreement. And that's also in on D2L in the syllabus folder. But I'll open it up here from my computer file. And essentially says, you print your name here, and you've read the syllabus thoroughly, and you understand your uh, responsibility to abide by these policies, and that you understand that failure to abide by these policies will result in the consequences in outlining the syllabus. And something I added since we've gone to Zoom, I'm going to be posting this video on my YouTube channel. And because of the FERPA laws, the student privacy laws from the federal government, I'm asking you to waive your rights for allowing me to put either your image, your name, or your voice, or all the above in my YouTube. Trust me, not many people other than students taking my class will ever see it. And you need to sign it and date it and get it to me before test number one. Why? Oh, wrong one. Let me get. There we go. Because if I haven't received your file as a PDF file, you won't be allowed to take test number one. You'll get a zero. So I ask you, we've got a couple of weeks, so you got a lot of time. And I have here a copy here, but see the D2L syllabus folder for this form that I just showed you. And once again, propane, CH3, CH2, CH3, propane. All right, any questions about the syllabus? Hi, Dr. White. I was on with the phone number earlier. So oh, I, you were the phone number. <laughs> All right. Well, now I know who you are. Thank you for letting me know. This whole time, yeah. When you were on with the phone number, could you see the screen? No, it just it's just your voice. That's it. Yeah. All right. Well, good news. You'll be able to watch everything you missed if you awesome. want to by going to the YouTube channel tonight. Okay? All right. All right. Thank you for letting me know. All right. How many of you have heard scary things about organic chemistry? Give me a thumbs up or go like this. Have you heard scary things about it? Because organic chemistry has a really bad reputation of being one of the hardest classes in all of college. It's not true, but I'm biased. I'm an organic chemist. And, but anyways, it's fun and you'll find out it's fun. Now, how many of you are planning on a career in organic chemistry? Raise your hand or give me a thumbs up. Just me. How many of you have, <clears throat> excuse me, an undying love for organic chemistry? Raise your hand. Oh, again, it's just me. I'm not sure yet. <laughs> not sure yet, but most people don't. Now, most of you, how many of you are here because either a college to get into or a program like nursing school or another types of prob, uh, programs say you've got to take organic chemistry? Raise your hand. See, I already knew that. So I'm not going to try and turn you into organic chemist, but I will teach you organic chemistry. Now, the question is, why learn organic chemistry? Good question. Well, my skin is organic molecules. 
Everybody, touch your back of your hand with your finger. Hopefully it won't hurt. You're touching organic molecules. My shirt, organic molecules. The dye, the red color, that's organic molecules. So is my hair, what's left of it. No, don't look. But anyways, uh, I should warn you, I have a sense of humor and I use it. And sometimes I have good humor days and sometimes, well, you and I both have to suffer through my humor. But anyway, that's organic. Now the term organic has been hijacked by advertising companies and uh, food producers to mean a high purity. But in reality, organic is anything that came from originally something that was alive. That's how it got the term organic. And it's been expanded much more. Speaking about that, all your food, except for water, which I don't know if that's considered a food or not, is organic molecules. That's organic chemistry. So let's see, why is it important to learn organic chemistry? Your skin is organic. Your muscles are organic chemistry. Uh, stuff like this is organic. The plastic of this bottle is organic chemistry. And let's see, I go on and on and on. And isn't it obvious why it's important to learn organic chemistry? Because someone said you have to take this class and you want to get a good grade. But over the by the end of the semester, you will learn my world of organic chemistry is your world of organic chemistry. You just don't know about it by the end of the semester, you will. Now, a little background information about Dr. White, me. I got my bachelor's degree, I think I might have mentioned it, but I'll go through it again, from IIT, Illinois Institute of Technology. Got my PhD in synthetic organic chemistry from Michigan State. From there, for many decades, I worked in the chemical industry, and most of that time as a senior research and development manager for major international chemical companies, where a couple of them I was responsible for all the research in North America for various aspects of that company. Part of my job was problem solving and also new products, develop them, and then I'd go to the chemical plants of the companies I worked for and supervise the first couple of times they ran it to make sure they made things correctly. And therefore, I have decades of experience in the chemical industry, not only in research, but in the plant, in the field, Another one of my jobs at those companies were if a customer of ours was having problems, I'd get sent to the customer to help solve their problem. I met some interesting customers, including General Motors, Ford, uh, and a whole lot of others, uh, Procter & Gamble, Unilever, and a whole bunch of companies. So your instructor has a very very long, many years experience in the real world in the chemical industry. By the way, I haven't said it in a while, propane, CH3, CH2, CH3, propane, and here it is in red again, CH3, CH2, CH3, propane. That's the gas for your barbecue, among other uses. Now, a couple of things. First of all, I teach by my golden rule of teaching. Hmm, what's that? That is, I don't do unto my students what I didn't like done to me as a student. Yes, I was a student long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. You Star Wars fans know where that came from. But anyways, that means in Chem 170, my test and final, I never have, never will use multiple choice. I hated it when I was a student. Luckily, when I was a student, it was very rare. But the ACTs and SATs, uh, yeah. I, I did good. I could have done much better if it wasn't multiple choice. Another thing about my test, every concept on my test, I will have covered at least twice. 
every concept on my test, I'll cover at least twice, usually a lot more. So you should do good on your test. Speaking about doing good, propane, CH3, CH2, CH3, propane. Now, one of the things I will tell you about on Monday, we have the long lecture, and it's the same if we were face to face. And I have learned that after sitting for about 50, 55 minutes, your brain shuts off. Therefore, we're going to take breaks. Normally, if we were face to face, we'd have 10 minute breaks that give students time to go to the restroom or uh, the vending machines, which are a nice distance, not that long from our classroom at ECC. But for now, what I do is we only take five minute breaks. I'll take two. And that means we'll get, don't worry about it, Ignacio. Ignacio uh, life happens. As long as you're able to get back, I'm happy. Uh, but anyways, um, we'll take a, two five minute breaks Instead of at 350, we'll get out at 340 because I'm only taking five, not 10 minute breaks. And that's not what I want. And propane, like I said, I'm going for the Guinness Book of World Record, CH3, CH2, CH3, propane. Now the question is, how do you get a good grade in organic chemistry? Because if, especially if you're going into nursing school, if you go there with an A in organic chemistry, they go bonkers after you, they want you. Because all the nursing schools know organic chemistry is impossible and hard. And in other schools, the way it's taught, it is impossible and hard, not the way I teach it. So how do you do good? Well, in order to teach you that, I have to talk about bicycles. Bicycles? Yep. Let's assume you don't know how to ride a bicycle. And being the nice person I am, I am, I give you the best Blu-ray movie, How to Ride a Bicycle. You've got a huge, real big, high-def TV and a real good Blu-ray a player. And for the next month or so, you watch that every day, over and over again, slow motion, you back it up, watch it again, slow motion. And by the end of a month or so, you know, every frame on that how to ride a bicycle Blu-ray disc by heart. What's going to happen when you get on a bicycle the first time? You're going to fall off. And with practice, you get better. Organic chemistry is no different. First of all, you're not going to learn it the night before an exam. You're not. I couldn't. I would never tried. You should. But I have provided practice problems and practice problem answers. And if you go to ratemyprofessor.com about me, you'll see a lot of students say, do the practice problems. That's why I created them. I'll go through them in class, but watch me do them which I will do problems in class, like you'll see on a test, oh, that doesn't look that hard. But when you go ahead and try it on your own, if it's on the test, boom, you're going to fall off and it won't be pretty. But if you do them on the practice problem, you have difficulty and then learn how to do it correctly, you'll do real good on my test and the final. All right, one of the things, let's see how we do on time. Yep, let's do it one more time. Propane, everybody see it on your screen? Give me a thumbs up if you can see it. Thank you. CH3, CH2, CH3, propane. All right, I'm going to ask you to try on your own. Write propane. What is it? What's the formula? 
try it on your own on a piece of paper right now. And hopefully you all did this. And you, I burned it into your brain. I've done this face to face, just like I did today. And a year or two later, I'll run into a student. And I say, remember what I did the first day? And if I was in a classroom, I'd point to the upper left or right hand corner. I just remember what I did on the board. And immediately they'll say propane and tell me what color here. I use mainly black and red. Sometimes I'll do blue and I'll be able to tell that immediately. What did I do? What I did was burn it into your brain by multiple times visually. I showed you it written out and orally said it, stage three, stage two, stage three, propane, a lot of times. Now I have found if you do it five times, write it down, say it, then come back and do it once more, it's burned into your brain. And there's a lot of memorization. I'm not going to sugarcoat it in organic. There is. It's part of the organic chemistry. Now, true story. I don't tell false, false stories. Years ago, I had a Chem 170 student and her friend were taking my class. And after test one, she came up to me and say, and she didn't do good on test one, how do I do better? And I asked her, did you write things out and say them five times? And she said, that's a lot of work. And her friend standing right next to her and said, yeah, but I got an A on the test. And the student, really? Yeah, I said, you should do that. She got the message next test. She did a lot better. And that type of repetition helps you memorize things. Now, if I look at the clock, Let's take a five minute break. I'll be back in five minutes, 155. I can get up and stretch a little and we'll continue on. I'll see you in five.
Let's get going. All right, welcome back. I'm still Dr. White, and this is Chem 170. All right. Well, in that case, it's time to start your trip, your learning experience in organic chemistry. And let me just close some stuff here. All right, now, in the book, they have a chapter one, which I don't cover most of the stuff, but let's cover important things you should know. I'm assuming you know what I mean when I say an atom. And in case you forgot, an atom is the smallest particle of an element with all the properties of an element. And you know what a molecule is. A molecule is two or more atoms held together by forces we call chemical bonds. And this won't be on a test. I should mention every once in a while, you'll see me go click, the switch is off. This won't be on a test because as far as I know, I never could read any of my teacher's minds and I don't think you can read mine. In fact, I know so. Well, I hope so. <laughs> now, I'll ask you, can you see my whiteboard now? White, thank you. All right, now, when it comes to the elements, I think you've all know the periodic table or of it, but for this class, we have a very shortened ones. And I'll never ask on a test, but you should know H is hydrogen and then you should know Na sodium, Li lithium, K potassium. I'll never ask that on a test, but I'll be using that. Then we'll have magnesium and calcium. Oh, one thing, this is how I do a G. Let me try it again. <laughs> Any way you look at it, it's going to look straight. Uh, if you can't read cursive, let me know. Uh, last year or two, a number of students said don't read cursive. They stopped teaching it a while ago in the school, which was very sad and stupid, in my opinion. All right. Next, some of the metals you should know, nickel, platinum, and palladium. And then the most important element on the periodic table to an organic chemist is carbon. You should know nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, and the halogens, fluorine, chlorine, that's Cl, bromine and iodine. Now I could put down there gold and silver, but we're never going to use it in this class. Even though if you want to send some to the Save Dr. White Foundation, you always can. But those are the elements. And so you should know if I put down that's a carbon, that's a hydrogen. Now, you should also be familiar with chemical formulas. The number to the right subscript tells you how many. This is methane. Yeah, this is I can't write today. You also know it is natural gas. But one of the things I'll do a lot is bring the real world into our classroom, because that makes organic chemistry fun, and it is. And you should know this has one carbon, four hydrogens. Again, this is hydrogen. The number to the right is how many? Subscript. And I think you've all seen this. I hope you have. H2O, water, and that's two hydrogens and one oxygen. This is all stuff you should have had in general chemistry. If not, well, I'm teaching you it now. Remember on Monday and Wednesdays from five to 
under a separate Zoom login. I'll have my office hour. If you have any questions, if you need any type of help, stop by. I'll be available. And you don't even have to drive to ECC. All right, so that's my periodic table. This will never be on a test. I'll never ask on a test, what's the name of the element with K, potassium? But I'll do that in the class where I'll say, here's something, potassium hydroxide. You should know that's the potassium oxygen, hydrogen. If not, ask a question. Remember, there's no such thing as a dumb question in my class. All right. Now, when it comes to chemical bonds, and this won't be on a test, but there are two types. Ionic and covalent. Ionic is by transfer one or more electrons from one atom or group of atoms to another atom or group of atoms. Covalent is equal sharing of pairs of electrons. I won't ask that on a test, but most of what we'll talk about, not all, but most, involves covalent bonds. Methane has all covalent bonds, and I'll teach you that during the semester. I think that's all of chapter one. So let me open up a few things that we'll need to continue on. All right, everybody see chapter two on your screen. Thank you. All right, what you see, this is available in D2L, the lecture folder, and it's cleverly hit name, chapter two, alkanes. And let's begin your journey into my world of organic chemistry which is really your world of organic chemistry. You just don't know about it. Now, when we talk about organic chemistry, we start out at the alkanes and cycloalkanes. And in order to start that, the first thing is hydrocarbons. Now, there are a few definitions I'll ask you to know. All right, what's going on with my pens here? Give me a second to log, close this down. All right, that worked all right. Let me open it again. Huh, that's weird. All right, give me one second to do something. This, my computer, this one was acting up earlier. Ah, now I know why. Yep, somehow I clicked on 
an icon in the bottom or clicked on its own, I learned something every day. Two years, this never happened to me. Now it did. There it is. At the bottom of Word, you're going to have the two different ways of having it as a print or a internet. And when it's on internet, my pen doesn't want to work. Now, let's get back to work. Sorry about the delay there. All right. Now, everybody, you see hydrocarbons, molecules with only carbon and hydrogen on there. I can be very subtle, and it's time for me to be subtle. See how subtle I can be? Know this. You should know what is a hydrocarbon. Those are molecules, or it's a molecule with only carbon and hydrogen atoms. On a test, I can ask you three points. What is a hydrocarbon? And you can put down molecules or a molecule with only carbon hydrogen atoms. Remember, carbon symbol C, hydrogen H. And when I put down hint, know this, that means you really should know it. Hint, aren't you glad I'm subtle? All right, now when it comes to hydrocarbons, there's two types that you should also know. And those are saturated hydrocarbons and unsaturated hydrocarbons. Now, a saturated hydrocarbon is a molecule with only carbon and hydrogen atoms, that's what a hydrocarbon is, in which all carbon-carbon bonds are single bonds. Again, everything you see on the screen, you can download from D2L, but if you're writing it down, go right ahead. I should warn you, I have the fastest mouse wheel finger this side and the other side of the Mississippi River, and a good question is, can you go back to your previous slide? And the answer will always be yes. So a saturated hydrocarbon is a molecule with only carbon and hydrogen atoms. That's a hydrocarbon, which all carbon-carbon bonds are single bonds. And let me remind you, Aren't you glad I perfected this on a tablet doing a whiteboard if I were in class face to face? Just to remind you, in case you didn't learn it in general chemistry. A single bond is one bond, one pair of electrons. That is something you should know. A double bond is two bonds or two pairs of electrons. And one other good question, if I'm writing something on a whiteboard like this and you can't make heads or tails of it, you can always ask me, what the heck did you just write? And finally, a triple bond, three bonds, which is three pairs of electrons. Remember, pair means two.
So types of covalent bond, single bond, one pair of electrons, double bond, two pairs of electrons or two bonds, triple bond, three pairs or three bonds between two atoms. Now, a saturated hydrocarbon, again, is a molecule with only carbon hydrogen atoms, which all carbon-carbon bonds are single bonds. There may be other types of bonds to other atoms, but, well, in a carbon, is, that's the only thing because there's only carbon hydrogen atoms. Now, the other type that you should also know, here's saturated, here's unsaturated. Unsaturated hydrocarbon, because it's a hydrocarbon, it's a molecule with only carbon hydrogen atoms that contain one or more carbon carbon multiple bond, otherwise known as one or more double or triple bond. And I'll teach you during the semester about carbon carbon single bonds, double bonds, and triple bonds. If you know baseball, first base, one bond between single bond, one pair of electrons, second base, two pair, triple, three pair, third going to third. All right, now, how many of you have ever heard about unsaturated and saturated fats? Have you heard those terms? Well, we'll learn later on. That's an industry I worked in also in the real world. Unsaturated fats have a double bond. Saturated fats only have carbon-carbon single bonds. All right, let's move on. Now, a specific saturated hydrocarbon are called the alkanes, an alkane. Now, switches off in terms of, I'll never ask you what is an alkane, but I'll use that terminology so you should be familiar with it. Oh, I should mention this semester, you'll learn a lot of key words that you can inf uh, really astound your friends, neighbors, and loved ones with your knowledge of all these amazing new words. And what is an alkane? Acyclic saturated hydrocarbon. Hmm. Saturated hydrocarbon means a molecule with only carbon and hydrogen atoms, and it only has carbon-carbon single bonds. Now, what is this acyclic? Well, cyclic is like a circle, round, a ring. Now, A, the prefix means without. So this is a molecule that's not a ring, and I'll teach you about rings. And that's an acyclic hydrocarbon. Propane is an example of an alkane. It's just a straight chain, we call it. Now, I will never ask you what the formula for alkanes are CN H2N plus two. Why do I put this down? Well, a couple of years ago, some students came back and told me that was on some of the entrance exams like nursing. I will never ask you. If you have five carbons, how many hydrogens? I can ask you a lot more important things than that. Now we'll talk more about it, but the geometry, the bond angles, and the way they're set up is called tetrahedral. And if you look at the model I have, think of the center black sphere as carbon. Then each rod is a bond, two electrons, and the gray spheres on the outside are hydrogen. This is methane. And this is what a molecule of methane looks like, natural gas. And this would be an acyclic, saturate, uh, an alkane, an acyclic, saturated hydrocarbon. Now, here's some examples. of alkanes, methane, CH4, that's natural gas. So if you live in a home or apartment or a condo with 
a furnace, it's using methane to burn to create heat to cool, uh, keep you warm in the winter. And Chicago winter land, Chicago winters can sometimes get brutally cold. Oh, by the way, I'm raised and born in the Chicago land area, but for five years I lived in East Lansing, Michigan, when I went to Michigan State for my PhD. Now, ethane is two carbons, and that is a molecule that uh, helps uh, sometimes will cure certain vegetables, not cure, cause certain vegetables to go black, not black, um, to, to ripen. That's the term I was looking for. Oh, look, it's your old friend propane, CH3, CH2, CH3. And this, you know, can be used for your barbecue to cause the flame to cook your meat. And these are all alkanes, acyclic hydrocarbons. If we look at propane, you can't see it now, but the bond between the two carbons is a single bond. Now there's something called cycloalkanes. And give me a second to get something. Hold on, I'll be right back. Don't run away. I'm back. And I have my models with me. Now, these are models. The center is a carbon. Bonds coming out are these rods. And if you notice, each one has a tetrahedral bond angle. And this is really how propane looks, even though we draw it. CH3, CH2, CH3. Hang in there while I'm getting things ready. Now, next I like to talk about the cycloalkanes. I'll never ask you what a cycloalkane is, but I'll use the term, so you should be familiar with it. And that's a saturated hydrocarbon, meaning only carbon-hydrogen atoms and carbon-carbon single bonds, that's a saturated. But now, because the cycloalkane, which the carbon atoms are to connect together in a cyclic arrangement, which we organic chemists call a ring. And I'll never ask on a test, but I've been told certain entrance exams, you got a cycloalkane, five carbons, how many hydrogens? And the answer would be if it's N is five, two N is 10. I'll never ever ask that on a test for my final. But now it's time for Dr. White to have fun with his models. And I will. Everybody see my models up here? All right, now if you look at the model, if I hold it right like this, there's one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. And this one is called hexane. When it's like this, it's an alkane. Now, if I connected two ends together, this we call a ring. And this has a name I'll teach you later on, cyclohel, uh, XA. And this is a ring. And I should warn you, I love rings. I really do. I've used them a lot in my career. And when they're connected like this, they're rings. And this one has six carbons. Here's this ring. And therefore, that's a cycloalkane when they're in this ring. Now, if you notice, this isn't flat like a piece of paper. It sort of looks like a chair, and it can also look like a boat. And this is a ring. 
Now, it turns out you can have rings connect to each other. And we'll talk about this later in the semester. You can have three six-member rings and one five-member ring connect together in a special way. And that forms the skeleton, the basis for all your hormones. Yep, that's organic chemistry too. Your steroids, otherwise known as hormones, have three six-member rings and a five-member ring all connect together. Which makes me uh, realize I didn't mention one thing. You know who's the greatest of all organic chemists? Mother Nature. The thing she's done is just totally amazing. And I can tell you, both Dr. White and Mother Nature love rings. They really do. So those are the cycloalkanes. Now, one of the most important things this semester on my test and in general in organic chemistry is how to draw structures. And there's different ways of drawing structure. And the most important is what's called the condensed structures. How do you do that? Now, before I teach you that, I have to talk about carbon atoms. And when we talk about carbon atoms, this will never be on a test. Carbon has four valence electrons. Those are the outermost electrons. And this is called the Lewis structure, which will never be on a test. And Hopefully you remembered in general chemistry, atoms lose, gain, or share electrons to have an octet, eight electrons. And if it has four, how many more does it need to get eight? Four. So important thing, and you should know this. There's always four bonds to carbon. Remember, carbon has four bonds to it. There's always four, ooh, I gotta get that finger fixed. Four bonds to carbon, not really. Four bonds to carbon, yes, four. I mean, I'm a dexterous, I can do it with both hands. Four, four, four bonds to carbon. You should remember that. Just like you know your own first name, I hopefully you know like that. You should know there's four, four bonds to carbon. And over the next couple of weeks, I'll be brainwashing you doing this a lot. By the way, have you noticed my classes in 3D? Does this look like it's coming at you? But anyways, there's four, four bonds to carbon. Ooh, oh no. I forgot to talk about the math needed for my class. And it's quite sophisticated. For the whole semester, you have to know how to add and subtract up to four. Next, and this now is getting a little more challenging, you have to know the numbers one through 10 and how to count up to 10. And then you have, now we're really getting tough. You have to know what numbers from one to 10 are larger, or smaller than the other numbers. And that's all the math you need for this class. That's it, we'll wait. About week, about 14 or 15, I may be off by a week. You have to know how to count up to 20 and which numbers are long, smaller or larger. Now it gets really hard. And you will not be allowed to use a calculator during my test or final, because you don't need one. All right, let's look at how to write, draw a structure. Everybody see my whiteboard? Thumbs up, people. Thank you. Now, propane has three carbons. And there's a single bond between each carbon. 
that's the line. You don't always have to put it there. I do, so I keep my structures straight or they start drooping toward the floor. Now, how many hydrogens on each one? There's four bonds to carbon. So if we look at this first carbon, it has one bond, but there should be four. High math time, four minus one is three. So there's three hydrogens on there. And we show that like that. That was tough. Well, if you don't know what it is. Now let's look at this carbon. How many bonds do we see to that carbon? One, two. How many bonds should there be to carbon always? Four. Four minus two, tough question. Hopefully you all got two. So that has two hydrogens. And there should always be four bonds to carbon. We look at the last carbon right here. How many bonds to it? One, four minus one. Well, we've already done that, is this. So the structure for propane, you can write with the lines or you can write it like this. Now, this is called the condensed form because the way you almost never see any organic chemist, especially Dr. White. Did I tell you organic chemists are very lazy? There's an easy way out. We'll take it. We do. This is expanded. And I rarely like ever, this just takes a lot more time and we're lazy. Two days later, I'll be finished. These are the same molecules. On tests, I'd like you to write it this way. You could do it this way, but you're wasting a lot of time. And you shouldn't have to waste a lot of time. That's profane. Remember, there's four bonds to carbon. You count the bonds to carbon that are not hydrogen, and you replace the add hydrogen, so there's four bonds to it. This, we have four carbons. Let's look at this carbon. How many hydrogens should be on there? Well, I see one bond and four minus one, because there should always be four bonds to carbon is three. So the remaining three bonds are made up by hydrogen. Let's look at this carbon. How many bonds to carbon? One, two. How many bonds should there always be? Four bonds to carbon. Four minus two is two. So there should be two hydrogens on there. Now, Dr. White doesn't like to hog all the fun to himself. So why don't you, for this and this carbon, figure out how many hydrogens there are? Your turn to have fun. Remember when you're starting out, things are hard. A month from now, you'll look back and say, how come that was so hard? Well, you were new to it. All right, let's take a look at this. It looks like we lost Ignacio again. He's having internet trouble. Hopefully, we'll get that fixed. And here, we look at this carbon right here. How many bonds do we see? One, two. So there should always be four bonds to carbon. Four minus two is two. 
So there are two hydrogens there. And if we look at this last carbon, how many bonds are there to carbon? One. Four minus one is three. And let me write it over again so it looks prettier. And this is a skill you should know. And you should know how to do this. And by the way, this molecule has a name, butane. And butane is the material, the chemical found in those plastic lighters or the bigger ones for your barbecue that you use in a butane lighter. That's why they're called butane lighters. Oh, let's try one more. And I'm going to let you try this one all on your own. Draw in the hydrogens for this molecule. And when you're done, give me a thumbs up or somehow indicate uh, that you're done. Which for now, Andrew, that means you, because uh, one student was having car problems why she's not here, and other student is having internet problems. All right, well, let's find out if you did. And that's why practice makes perfect. Let's look at the first carbon. One bond here. There should always be four. Four minus one is three. So that should be CH3. This carbon right here has one bond to it. Four minus one, because there's always four bonds to carbon, is three. So that would be there. And this is a three. This carbon right here, one bond to it. There should be four bonds to carbon, four minus three, like that. Now, let's take a look at this carbon right here. How many bonds are there? One, two, three. And there's always four bonds to carbon. Four minus three equals one. So there's one hydrogen there. Finally, this carbon right here, there's one, two bonds to it. Four minus two equals two. And that's how, and let me rewrite it so it looks nicer. And that's how you do that. Remember, there's four bonds to carbon. And I'll teach you more about that, but that's an important friend. Knowing there's four bonds to carbon will help you on test one, two, three, four, and the final exam. The students had looked at their answers and checked that there are always four bonds to carbon. About 70% of the wrong answers on a test or the final student would have said, that can't be right. And they were correct. It can't be right. There's always four bonds to carbon. Now, there's something called condensed structures with parentheses. 
we won't do this until we get way late in the semester. And let me show you an example of what this is. And on the test, I don't use it until we get into fats and oils. Now, this is called hexane, and I'll teach you the names later on this chapter. And notice I have six carbons, one, two, three, four, five, six. However, bonded to each other, notice there are four, one, two, three, four CH2 groups that are connected to each other, bond to each other. So a shorthand we can use CH3, then bracket, the repeating unit, in this case CH2, how many times is it repeated? Subscript four to the right of the closing bracket, and then the end CH3. And this is with parentheses. Now, I'd highly recommend until we get into fats and oils, you stick with this. You want to use the parentheses, you can, but I'd stick with the top one. You'll make less mistakes. But if you want, you can make use the bottom one. Now, I don't have a slide for this, but there's something for both. I'll talk about it when we get into rings, but now I'll talk about it. And that's the line method. And the line method is for every bend in a line is a carbon. And every end of a line is a carbon. I'd highly recommend you stay away from it. The students make mistakes when they use it. But here we have butane, four carbons. The line method would be this. One, two, three, four. And this would be the same thing. I would recommend, and on my test, I'll write it this way. Do I know this way? Of course. But for this class, since you're all starting out in organic chemistry, it makes sense for you to use the way that will help you get succeed the best. And he's back. Whatever surface you're having, get a different one. Uh, it used to be, wow, but do you have RCN astound in your area? Well, I'm actually in Florida right now. Oh, you are? Wow. Yeah, at, a, at an Airbnb. So, yeah. At a what? I'm staying at an Airbnb. When are you going to be coming back to Illinois? Uh, probably November. Well, see if you can get better internet access. Yeah. <laughs> Aren't you glad I'm doing this all online? Definitely. <laughs> I can look back. I actually had two semesters ago during a class, uh, right before spring break, a student, or during right the week before, a student was in my class in a car going to Florida from Illinois on Zoom. Interesting. All right. So that's condensed structures. And again, Ignacia, anything you missed, you can see on the video later tonight or tomorrow morning. All right, the other important thing is how to draw ring cycloalkanes. And they're represented by polygons. Poly means many, gon sided. And here, for each bend in a line is a carbon. We use the line method. Now, I won't do this one. Each end of the line is a carbon atom. Intersections are carbon atoms, but hydrogens are not shown. Now, in most of organic chemistry I've done, and you'll ever encounter, there are only three types of three rings you should know how to draw. This is going to be one of the rarest times you'll see me showing a ring with the carbons and hydrogens, probably the only time this semester. 
This is called cyclohexane. And I'll teach you the names this chapter. And notice there are six carbons, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, this is how you should know how to draw a cyclohexane ring. Six carbons, six sides. And that's how you draw a cyclohexane ring. Each bend in a line is a carbon. Notice six carbons. These are the same molecules. Now, I've been drawing these a few more months than you have. Wow, that's an understatement, like a few more decades. And yours aren't going to look as pretty as mine. And sometimes mine don't look pretty. You know how you have you ever heard anybody say they have a good hair day or bad hair day? You ever heard that? Well, sometimes I have good ring drawing days, sometimes I don't. That's a pretty good one. Uh, on my tests, I have software called ChemDraw that draws the rings just like you see on the internet or in a book or paper. Speaking about the internet, time out for a little important thing. How many of you are familiar with Wikipedia? I used to call it Wikipedia until years ago. My students would always yell at me, no, it's Wikipedia. They taught me the right way to pronounce it. I don't know about other things, but in chemistry and especially organic chemistry, Wikipedia for a number of years has been so heavily policed, like me and others, many, many others, that I have yet for a number of years now seen anything wrong in Wikipedia for organic chemistry. So. If you ever want to look at it, let's just do a real quick thing. Everybody see cyclohexane on your screen? And notice their ring looks a lot nicer than mine. There are other ways of drawing it, which we won't. This right here is totally useless, the three-dimensional. This is important. This we won't cover in this class, the skeleton. At my level, yes, for here we don't. But the other thing is they have a lot of nice information. And on the right, lower down, they have a lot of nice physical properties that at my level, are always interesting. And this stuff has been always been policed and it's pretty accurate now. So let's get back to rings. This is a six member ring. How do we draw a five member ring? Well, five sided pentagon. One, two, three, four, five. This is called cyclopentane. I'll teach you about that later in this chapter. And whenever I see a cyclopentane ring, I think of the little greenhouses of Monopoly. Ah, Christiana just made it back. Hopefully your car is doing better. And this is a five member ring. Now, two more rings. Now, you'd call that a square, organic chemists call it a ring. And there's one, two, three, four carbons. That should be a straight line. And that's another ring. Each bend in a line is a carbon. We don't show hydrogens like here. But, and one last ring, one, two, three. You'd call that a triangle. Nope, I'm an organic chemist. I'm going to say that's a ring. And that's how you do it. Now, we'll go through this. We'll do practice. But I just wanted to introduce you to them. And I should say 
Dr. White, Mother Nature, love rings. And in penicillin, there's a four carbon ring or four atom ring like this. In your hormones, there are three, six, and one, five, all connected together. So these are things in your daily life. And I'll say it publicly, you should never say you're sorry in my class. You don't have to, life happens, trust me. I've lived enough of it to know it. So I'm just glad, Christiana, Anna, and correct me if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, you were able to make it back to class. If you wanna stick around a couple of minutes at the end of the class today, we can talk about how you can see everything if you, the stuff you miss. And life happens, it's happened to me. In fact, what was it? Was the beginning of the summer? No, it was the uh, last April. I pull into the parking lot at College of DuPage and I could see this line of dripping from where I turned into the parking spot. And sure enough, I had a hole in one of my radiator hoses. I went to my dealership after class and luckily I didn't have another class that day. And they were able to fix it. <laughs> All right, let's continue on. Now, I won't ask you on a test, but there's a term called isomers. Those are compounds with the same molecular formula but different structural formula. And they have different physical properties. And I'll talk about isomers. I'll never ask you on a test what's an isomer, but I'll use the, uh, the term a lot. Here's an example. In case you're wondering, a couple of years ago when we switched to Zoom, one of my colleagues at ECC, uh, one of the other uh, instructors in chemistry, told me about a great writing tablet. I'm using the Huion 1060 Plus, and you can get it for Amazon for under $60. And then I perfected doing it on Word, and I practice a lot. Now, these are let's call it A and B, one from column A, one from column B, and they're different molecules. But if you notice, both have four carbons and 10 hydrogens. Both are C4H10. And these A and B are isomers. The same molecular formula, the way I have it drawn here, this is showing the structural formula. Oh, that reminds me, a number of years ago, I was watching cable TV and sitting in my Lazy Boy, I've had Lazy Boys, Lazy Boy recliner, rocker recliners. I'd say, wow, over 40 years now in various houses I've lived in apartments. They're great. If you don't have one, you should. But anyways, I'm watching it. All of a sudden, there was this commercial for this uh, perfume company and personal care, uh, not perfume, cosmetic company. And you know what the name of that company was? Isomers. And I started laughing, I almost fell out of my chair. I was laughing so hard. Come on, can't you be more original? All right, now, if you notice up here, I had two different molecules and I had to say A and B. Well, that's not that good. Well, it turns out, Back about 1910 or so, this started to be a problem in organic chemistry or chemistry in general. And what happened was, ooh, oh my God, 
it's time for a break. Let's take a five minute break. I'm having so much fun talking about organic chemistry. Forgot about breaks. Come back at 2.55. I can get up and stretch and I'll be back in five minutes. So let's take a break and come back in five.
sorry about being a minute or so late. Let's get going. All right. Now, I was starting to talk about the problems with naming compounds. And because of that, around 1910, 1912, it was delayed because of World War I. Uh, 133 countries in the world got together and signed a treaty. United States was one of the signatures of that treaty. And that treaty can uh, create a, an international world organization that was responsible for the naming of all chemicals and most of their work is for organic chemicals. And that group is International Union Pure Applied Chemistry. I think it's neat to say that, called IUPAC. I'll never ask on a test, what does IUPAC stand for? But that's International Union of Pure Applied Chemistry. And this happened right after World War I, about 1919, 1920. Everybody finally signed it and it was created. And if we go to the internet and use Google, everybody see the inter uh, UPAC website? And before the internet, every couple of years, they put out a book. And it's uh, actually, it was a series of books and it'd have a color. Notice they're using the gold book now. And the last I saw, when I saw a copy once in a library, it was like over 3,000 pages and it had all the rules for all chemicals. Do I know all the IUPAC rules? No. Do I know the ones and areas I work for? Like I know my first name. By the way, I do know my first name. And We'll be, you'll be learning these, not all of them, but the key ones. And again, whenever I say IUPAC, you don't have to know that says International Union of Pure Applied Chemistry. Sounds cool to say that, but I'm an organic chemist, but that means the official name. Now for alkanes, the name of continuous straight chain or alkanes from one to 10 are in this chart right here. Now, this is from the book, if you had bought the book, which you don't need to, and there's way too much information. What I did, and this is available in the lecture section of D2L, is I made a table here. Give me time I do this. All right, everybody see the alkanes name table on your screen. All right, here you should know Time for Dr. White to be subtle. I can't write it on here, but hint, hold on. Let me get your attention. Did I get your attention? You should know the IUPAC names and the number of carbons, one through 10. Methane, one carbon. Ethane, two carbon. Oh, you know, propane, three carbons. Butane, four. Pentane, five. Hexane, six. Heptane seven, octane. What if I heard octane before? How many of you have seen the octane number on gas station pumps? Well, back around 200, uh, 1905, uh, not 205, well, that was, no, no, 1905, when they were first starting with automobiles and gasoline was new too, the gasoline with the most octane isomers you had the least knock in your engines for form vest. They came up with octane number. By the way, no name is 10, decane is uh, no name nine, decane 10. Now it continues on. 11 is undecane, 12 is dodecane, 
18 is octadecane. You don't have to know those. For our daily life, these are the 10 you should know. What do I mean by no? You should know three carbons is propane. We see uh, propane, you should know it has three carbons. If you haven't memorized this chart, you'll have lost 50 points on test one out of Andre. On test two and three, about 35, 40 points. On test four, less. On the final, you've lost about 40% of the points, 35, 40%. So you need to learn this chart. In other words, memorize it. And how do you do that? As I showed you earlier, write down the word methane and one carbon and do it a second time. Methane, one carbon. And you do that for all of it. Yep, it's a lot of work, but it gets the job done. Now, this is available in D2L. Hold on, I'll wait until everybody's finished copying this. But while you're doing that, I'll be right back. I gotta get a refill from my water. All right, everybody done copying it? Now, let me just show you something. Excuse me while I log in again. If you go to the lecture section, everybody see D2L on your screen? If you go to the main here, D2L, Chem 170, click on contents, we're right here. And if you click on lectures, you'll see at the very top, well, it used to be, they are right here, alkanes, IUPAC name and number of carbons, I have it both as a PDF and as a Word document that you can download. Also, I'll be showing you this later today. You have the key alkyl groups, both as a Word document and a PDF, which you can download at your leisure. And in case you didn't recognize Alkane's chapter two, I have also here all the slides I show on here are available to you to download D2L anytime you have internet access, hopefully all the time. So what does this mean? Everybody see three points each on your screen? Thank you. And remember, you can always come back to the video. And on tests, three points each. If I ask, give the IUPAC name for, and you see this, how many carbons are there? One is an alkane. And one carbon you learn from the table is methane. And if you look at the screen, B, give the IUPAC name for this. 
Now remember, you got to know how to count up to 10. How many carbons are there? One, two, three. It's an alkane. You've learned this table. Three carbon alkane is called once propane. And the answer would be, oops, let me, propane. Now, there are two types of nomenclature question. Remember, nomenclature is the fancy word for name. And there are two types of naming questions, or let me put it nicer. There are two types of nomenclature naming skills you should have in organic chemistry, which means there are two types of questions I can ask on a test. The first one is give the IUPAC name for the following. And by the way, if you ever see something I write and you can't make it out, ask me, what did you write there? And you can be polite or impolite. I don't know, what's that chicken scrawl? But anyways, one type of question is, give the IUPAC name for the following. And I'll give you a structure and you have to know the name. That's why you have to learn that table. I would get started as soon as possible. You're not gonna learn organic chemistry the night before. And as I mentioned earlier, I have never, never will give a multiple choice question on a Chem 170 test. An example, the other type of question is, draw the structure and I'll give you the name. And we'll learn later on the semester, there's IUPAC names and they're common names. Common names were developed before IUPAC was enacted. And one thing I should mention up front, the people at IUPAC did such a wonderful job, and I mean this in all sincerity, that I have never seen a case where two different molecules have the same name. If they're different, they have different names. If you get them with the same name, that means you made a mistake because IUPAC never has. I, at least I don't know of any. And let's just say I've been doing IUPAC names, oh, I hate to say this, since about 1970. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. And that's undergrad and grad school and in the chemical industry. God, that's over 50 years. Ouch. But anyways, I've never seen a mistake. Now, you want your three points. So how do you draw the structure for propane? You've learned this chart. Propane, three carbons. So now we have a alkane with three carbons. That means only carbon-carbon single bonds. So I'll draw my three carbons. You know there's four bonds to carbon. So the first carbon has one bond, four minus one is three. So there's three hydrogens. This carbon has two bonds to it or lines and four minus two is two, so it has two hydrogens. And this last carbon has one bond to it. Remember, there's always four bonds. Hold on, time out for a public service announcement from Dr. White, four bonds to carbon, four bonds to carbon. There's always four, four, yes, four bonds to carbon. Remember that, that will be an important friend of yours in my class. And we go back to the last one. There's one bond, four minus one equals three. Math is hard in this class. And that's how you draw propane. Oh, let me have you have some fun. And on a test, I could say three points each, draw the structure. 
and it would be butane. Ooh, that's an awful looking N. Don't look. That's better. And you have learned, hint, you have learned, memorized this chart. How many carbons in butane? Well, you've learned four. So I'm going to put my four carbons. Now, I'll let you put in the hydrogens because I want you to have some fun today, too. It's your turn. Finish this one, put in the hydrogens. Remember, there's four bonds to carbon. And when you're done, give me a thumbs up. I try and give everybody time to finish. <laughs> Does that mean you're not done or you're just lost or none of the above? I, I have a question, but um, maybe go for it. Go for it. Well, I'm kind of lost with, I see where you like you do four minus one on the first one, right? All right, let's do it. <laughs> and this, you're new to it. Now, yeah. some people catch on faster than others. Some people don't. Don't worry about it. You're new. You're a rookie, right? You haven't lost your rookie status in organic chemistry. This first carbon, see one line to it, right? There's four bonds to carbon. There's already one between these two carbons, and that would be three. Okay? Now, let's look at this carbon. How many lines do you see there? Two, that's the bonds. Hold on, I'll go technicolor. By the way, on a serious note, and don't say it publicly, but if any of you are colorblind, red, green, I use red a lot, and blue, not so much green in this class, let me know. See the two dots here in red? There's two bonds right here and here. There's always four bonds to carbon. Four minus two is two. So that means this has two hydrogens. Does that help you? If you're not clear, come I'm to good. Talk. I'm good up to there. The Why next... are you getting it? Uh, oh, by the way, I should mention, when you've learned something new and the instructor says, go up, do you see it? Guess what? Maybe you don't. I've been there and it's hard to think when the instructor's throwing questions at you. Real hard, been there, done that. Remember, I was a student too, and I remember it. Now, the same carbon, cis carbon right here has two bonds and should have four. So that's why it has two hydrogens. And this last carbon has one bond to it, one line. There should always be four bonds to carbon. Well, that one line is one bond. How do you make up the rest to get the four? Four minus one is three, and that's how you do it. Now, remember, tonight I have my office hours from 5 to 6.15. Feel free always to come to them to ask questions. I don't record it. Uh, let me check something real quick. Yep, I'm recording once in a while. I forget. Did I first lecture? Did I set it up with auto record? And I did. But this is how you do it. Again, there's two types of nomenclature. Here's the structure. Give the name for an acyclic like this. You just count the carbons, three carbons, propane, one carbon, and methane. For here, you have the name propane. You've learned this table, propane, three carbons, Pro propane, three carbons. And then you draw the structure with three carbons. And here it is. Now, 
I'll open it from my computer. <clears throat> Have you noticed on the screen right now, this is available in the lecture, um, not the lecture, the practice problems section of D2L. I have the alkanes problem set, and notice just like we just did, give the IUPAC name for the following. Three carbons, it would be propane. By the way, I also have another folder with the answers too. And we'll go through a lot of this, but I just wanted to show you how we do that. And then here, draw the structure. Condensed means you don't have to have each hydrogen coming out. If you want to, it's okay, but it's a waste of time. And we just did butane. You know, butane ha has how many carbons? Four. You draw it, and that's this. And if you know, oh, look how long ago I did this. I've been teaching it that long. Actually, longer. I made these earlier. This was a modified I changed in 2014. Wow. But anyways, let's get back to nomenclature. But like I said, you have yeah, wrong. You need to learn this chart. Start today. This is your friend. If you don't know this table, test one coming up in a couple of weeks, uh, you just lost 50 points out of 100. If you don't know this by heart, Pentane five carbons, octane eight, decane 10. Now, before I forget, I have worked for various chemical companies. And one of them I worked for for a number of years. And I was in charge of all research and new product development, also problem solving. And I was one of the few PhD research chemists that marketing salespeople took to uh, customers that I went out and talked to a lot of the petroleum companies because we sold molecules that are additives they put in gasoline, otherwise known as Shell, Mobile, and other companies. And I got to learn from them. And one of the things I've learned and to this day is still true, this is my own personal opinion, this won't be on any test or anything, the best gasoline for your car, which is a mixture of alkanes and other molecules, is shell. It's the best, and it has been for decades. And there are various reasons why it's the best. And the people in the industry believe that too. Right very close to it, almost as good, is mobile. Now, Marathon, I forget who they buy from, because they don't make their own, I don't think. But it's a good gasoline also. Now, the worst. gasoline, and it's been this way for decades, is BP. It used to be standard. I will not go into BP station, period. I haven't in decades once I learned about the quality. Now, how can I prove that to you? Well, unfortunately, about oh, four or five years ago, in the Gary, Indiana, and uh, right across the border from Gary in Illinois, that part of Illinois, they sold some very bad gasoline. It was so bad, it destroyed the car engines of over 3,000 cars that BP had to pay to have replaced. How bad does gasoline have to be to destroy your engine? Well, pretty bad. And that's why I stay away from it. Now, one other thing I would like to show you Huh. This has been slow today. Let me try another browser. I've been, for some reason, Firefox doesn't like this site. Hmm. 
That's what I really use on this machine. You can see I don't even. All right, everybody see on their screen Gas Buddy Chicago. The actual site URR is chicagogasprices.com. I've been using this site for a long time. If we we're in the Elgin area, you'll see right here the different prices. And notice they can zoom a lot over an area, just in a local area. And this is a good way of finding gas prices. I also teach at College of DuPage in Glen Ellen, put in the zip code. And here are different prices in that area. And this way I can save a lot of money by an area I'm in. I'm in the Schomburg area. And you can see also it varies a lot. Uh, I don't know where this Thornton's is, but I'm never going to go there. But this sh shell, by the way, this is near Woodfield. And the shell stations near Woodfield always rip off people because they're from out of state. They buy gas there. But if you notice here, this one is 439. Over here, there's another one not far from the one I just showed you, 423. And this shell is 449. So this is a great site to find near your house the lowest gas price is real easy. At chicagogasprices.com. If you forget about it, email me and I'll let you know what it is. And that's a public service from me, Dr. White. See all the things you're learning about in my class? All right. Now, let's continue on with the IUPAC names. If you have a continuous strain, chain, the general name for acyclic saturated hydrocarbons, alkanes, I'll never ask that. And Scott will learn later on endings are important and then A and E ending. Alkanes without branches are named according to the number of carbon atoms, which propane three carbons we just did. Now let's talk about alkanes with branches. Oh, tonight at midnight, I'll be giving speed uh, structure drawing lessons. No, I won't. Seven across and a carbon here on this third carbon over there. Now, if you look at this molecule, all the carbons aren't in a straight chain. Notice right here, we have that CH3 coming <clears throat> off this straight chain. That's called a branch. Have you, I assume you've all seen trees. Hopefully they have, or what world have you been living on? Notice how you have the trunk, then coming out from the trunk of a tree, you have branches. Well, that's where this got its name. So the question is,
on a test, and it's also a skill in organic chemistry. What is the IUPAC name for the following molecule? Well, how do I do that? This isn't a straight chain. And if we look at this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, plus here, eight. It's not octane, good guess, but no, and eh, you're wrong. But let's take a look at this. And for alkanes with branches, the root name is that of the longest continuous chain of carbon atoms. What do we mean by continuous chain? I have here, oops, time to get personal. See the gold chain I have here with links? And let me put it away. <laughs> Anyways, they're linked together. Carbon atoms directly bonded to each other, organic chemists call linked together, like chains are linked together. So the question is, how do we find the longest continuous chain of carbon atoms in a molecule, because you need to do that. Well, let's look at it. This carbon is bonded to this carbon, is bonded to this carbon, is bonded, and we, how do we know? Because that line, or if there's no line, they're just next to each other, to this carbon, to this carbon, to this carbon, to this carbon. So all the carbons across, ignoring the CH3 is seven carbons. That's one chain. I could have said this is one bonded to two, bonded to three, and this carbon is bonded to that carbon, which would be four. That's a chain. And there's one more chain. This carbon, it doesn't matter which end, coming bonds to that carbon, bonds to that carbon, bonds to that carbon, four, five, and down here is six. So there's three different possible chains. Remember, carbon atoms bonded or linked together. Now, you have to use your high level math skills for my class, which is the largest number, four, six, or seven. And time's up, hope we all pick seven. And let me remind you, I don't know if I mentioned this, in high school, German class, I was very lucky to have a great teacher. I still remember his name, that was decades ago. I can still picture him, great teacher, great guy, Herr Brink, Herr means Mr. in German, and Herr Brink was actually from Germany. And so we learned a lot. And he would write his sevens like this, which is the German or European way. And I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. And ever since I've been writing that, because Dr. White likes to be cool. Hopefully you all like to be cool too. So the longest chain is seven. And that's how we, what we call the root chain. So let's get rid of these numbers that I don't need anymore. So here's the longest chain that I'm circling. You don't have to do this on a test, but I'm teaching you how to do this. Well, what do you call that? Well, you've learned this chart and, and seven is heptane. So the root name is heptane. And right now you're gonna be confused and say, oh, this is hard. Yes, it is now. But we'll do practice, and you'll do it on your own, too, with the practice problems. So the root name is heptane. Am I done? No. This is left over. What do we call what's left over? A branch. When is this carbon, hydrogens, and carbon, carbon, single bonds? First of all, you can call anything left over substituents. But when it's carbon hydrogen, excuse me, and carbon carbon single bonds, we call that an alkyl group. So CH3 is called an alkyl group.
and um, if you look on your screen in the lecture folder i have both as a pdf and also as a word document key alkyl groups and what is ch3 attached to something else i don't know why that line's there it's gone it's called a methyl group this line here means it's bonded to a chain or we'll learn later on a ring and this is called the methyl group. Now, there are other groups, two carbons, ethyl, three carbons. Again, you can download this from D2L at your leisure. If you have any problems, always feel free to contact me by email or come to my office hours. If you have three carbons, there's two possibilities for an alkyl group. If the end carbon is bonded to the longest chain or a ring, it's called n-propyl. If you have three carbons and the center carbon of those three, it's called isopropyl. Anybody ever hear of isopropyl alcohol, like in rubbing alcohol? I wonder where it got its name. Well, you'll learn from here. Now, when you have four carbons, there are three possibilities. One of those I have never seen in my career as an organic chemist. So I'm not going to teach it to you because you're never going to encounter it. If I haven't, you won't. But the two you will, when there are four carbons and the N carbon is bonded to something, it's called N-butyl. When there are four carbons and three carbons are bonded to a center carbon that's called terp-butyl, and being an organic chemist in about a week or two, I'm going to be a lazy organic chemist and just call it a T-butyl group. Now, you're going to find out Dr. White is really an organic chemist. Dr. White loves T-butyl groups, loves isopropyl groups. They've been good to me. I've been good to them. Methyl and ethyl, and those are good too, but I really love T-butyl and isopropyl. Now, one carbon is called the methyl group. Again, this might seem difficult, but in about three weeks, you'll say, wow, why did I have any, all these problems? Well, you're new to this. So CH3 on a long chain, the heptane, is called methyl. Now, if you are typing this, this is all lowercase, I have a bad habit of capitalizing some of the letters on a test. You're going to be writing it in or typing it in. I don't care if it's cap, slower cap, or mixture. Am I done? No. So first of all, longest chain, seven carbons, heptane. Leftover CH3 methyl group. Now, groups attached to the main chain are called substituents. I'll never ask you that on a test, but I'll use that terminology. Saturated substituents containing carbon and hydrogen atoms are called alkyl groups. Now, this is one way of memorizing or learning the alkyl groups. The table is better. Now, the main chain is numbered in such a way that the first substituent encountered from the end of either chain receives the lowest possible number. Each substituent, and we've only got one, but you can have more than one, is located by its name and the number of carbon of the uh, number of carbon atom, the number of the carbon atom which it's attached to. What does that mean? Well, well let's go back and take a look at our example. Now, if I start from this end, my methyl group CH3 is on carbon three. When numbering, you can only start from the ends, not in the middle. That's a common mistake students make on test one. I'll remind you about that so you don't make that mistake. If I start from this side, one, two, three, four, five, which is the smaller number? 
three or five. And time's up. Hopefully I'll pick three. See the math is how hard it is. And therefore you use a smaller number. You start from this end, not this end. And that's three. So this is three methyl heptane. And that's the IUPAC name. Now, if you're confused, don't worry. We just started this. We'll do plenty of practice. Now let's go through and what did I do? I found the longest chain of carbons connect together. Notice there were three possible chains and I'll be very honest. I've been doing this a few more months than you. <laughs> oh, is that an understatement? And I've got to count each way like I just did. There's no way of looking at it and saying, oh, that's the longest chain. You got to get in there and count. Now, once you find the longest chain, seven carbons, you go to the table that you memorized. Hint, seven is heptane. That's the root name. And once I say seven, all the carbons that I've circled are spoken for. Are we done? No, we have CH3 left over. That's called an alkyl group. And how, what do we call that alkyl group, CH3? You've learned this table. And, and again, write this down and say it five times and that will help you memorize it. CH3 attached to something is called a methyl group. And here we have a methyl group and that goes in front of the root name. So it's methyl heptane. Now, if you are living in an apartment or a house or a condo, and I sent you a postcard in the mail, and I put your name, your street name, your city, state, maybe your zip code, but not your uh, part, you know, your street number, what's the chances of you getting that postcard? Zero. Well, the same thing. You need a number like an address, house number, apartment number, or condo number, where is the methyl group? How do you determine that? You start from the ends and you give it the number that has the lowest number. I start from this end, one, two, three. I start from this end in red, five, three is left, and that's three methyl heptane. And because we're only taking five minute breaks instead of 10 minute breaks, oh no, we're out of time. Now, quick thing. As I said, you learn a lot about me, and my religion is Jewish. And the reason I'm telling you this is uh, Jewish people, a lot of them, is, it's dying out somewhat, unfortunately, speak Yiddish. Yiddish is a mixture of German and Hebrew. And one of the greatest people I ever met in my life, probably the most amazing woman I've ever met in my life, was my mother's mother, my grandmother, Greenman. And when we would leave as little kids and even older, She'd always say in Yiddish to us, gain gesund. And gain gesund means go in health. And since the pandemic, I've been doing that all, always. We're done for today. You've got tomorrow off. You uh, survived your first day of organic chemistry. And we'll meet on Wednesday. Remember today at 5 to 6.15 on Zoom with a different login. I'll have my office hour. If you have any questions, come on by. And with that, I'm going to say gain gesund, just like my grandmother would say to me, which is Yiddish for go and help. And then most of you don't know about the Beverly Hillbillies, which is a great TV show. And at the end, Granny would always do at the end of the show, goodbye. And she'd do it like this. So I'm stealing it from Granny. Goodbye. Gain gesund. Goodbye. I will either see you in my office hours today or on Wednesday at 1 p.m. Bye now.